Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, store-operated calcium entry, also known as capacitative calcium entry. So let's just have a brief summary of where we've got to so far. So we started off by stimulating the H1 receptor with histamine. That led to the production of IP3 and ositol 145 trisphosphate so IP3 went up in, the vicin in a local uh, compartment of the cell and uh, it caused uh, calcium release from uh, the endoplasmic reticulum into that portion of the cell. Uh, the calcium, some of it was then returned into the ER by the sarco endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase and a bit of it was then uh, pumped out of the cell uh, by the plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase. So overall, once this process has finished and is over, uh, you've overall lost calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum because the amount that was returned back in is less than the amount that you released because some of the uh, calcium that you released from the intracellular stores was pumped out of the cell by the plasma membrane associated calcium ATPase. So overall, that's going to mean the calcium concentration in the ER goes down. Now, uh, we can't continue at this rate because otherwise uh, we'll, we'll, we will eventually have no calcium left in the endoplasmic reticulum and then we won't be able to continue with our uh, alpha, uh, well, GQ signaling pathways. So, uh, what we have in uh, the endoplasmic reticulum is a protein known as STIM1, standing for Stromal Interaction Molecule 1. And basically, uh, this protein has on its ER lumen um, domain an EF hand domain, which binds calcium. Now, when the calcium concentration is at the correct level in the ER lumen, calcium is bound to the EF hand of domain of this um, STIM1 protein. And STIM1 is in a conformation like this, which is its inactive conformation. Now, when calcium levels go down in the ER, the conformation of STIM1 changes, and instead it takes on a conformation that looks like this. So uh, the uh, channel activating domain stops being bound to this acidic region here. And that means that this channel activating domain is now free to do what its name says it needs to do, which is interact with a channel, which is going to be the channel which allows calcium to come in from the um, extracellular fluid into the cytoplasm, and then we're going to let the circa pump it back into the endoplasmic reticulum to replace the calcium that we lost, basically. And that movement of calcium back into the ER from the extracellular um, extracellular fluid is called um, capacitative calcium entry or uh, store-operated calcium entry. We haven't yet seen what channel this is going to uh, stimulate, but we will see very shortly. Okay, uh, the other thing that happens is that when your uh, STIM1 protein changes conformation in this way, it starts to aggregate together. So you get these STIM1 aggregates in the, um, in the uh, membrane of the ER. Also, uh, because of the polybasic uh, tail of uh, the STIM1 prote uh, protein, which is right at the tip of the STIM1 protein, uh, these STIM1 aggregates start to interact favorably with the uh, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bilayer because uh, the phospholipid heads face the cytoplasm, and these phospholipid heads are negatively charged because they have phosphate groups which have a negative charge. So the positive charge on the polybasic tail of these STIM1 aggregates is going to interact favorably with the negative charge on the uh, phosphate groups of these phospholipid um, heads. Right, okay, uh, so these STIM1 aggregates are going to uh, basically aggregate in the, well, they're going, they've they're forming in the ER membrane and they're going to interact with the plasma membrane. So they're going to bind to the ER, um, well, they're, they're bound in the ER down here, but they're also going to bind to this plasma membrane of the cell. Right, so what is the STIM1 aggregate actually going to do? Well, it needs to stimulate a channel, basically, in the um, plasma membrane, which uh, is permeable to calcium. And this channel, has many different names, so I will go over the different names of this channel. 
Uh, it is called the store operated channel. So you will see a lot of people refer to it as the store operated channel. And it was because for many years we knew this channel must exist, but we didn't know what it actually was. So we just called it the store operated channel or the SOC, SOC for short. Right. Um, another name that can be used for store operated channel uh, is uh, the calcium release activated calcium channel. So calcium release activated calcium channel is another name for this uh, channel which the STIM1 protein is going to uh, open. So calcium release activated calcium channel. Okay, so I'll just move this over here. So calcium release activated calcium channel. And uh, for short, we can abbreviate that to C-R-A-C or crack. So uh, you will sometimes see this channel referred to as the store operated channel. You will sometimes see it referred to as the calcium release activated calcium channel. Both of those names um, were names that were used prior to what we actually knew this channel was. Now we know what this channel actually is. So now you will often hear it referred to as the aura eye channel. So aura eye channel. And that's after the proteins which are uh, making up this channel basically. Okay, so let's have a look at the uh, structure of this aura eye channel or this store operated channel in a bit more detail. So let's bring out the uh, phospholipid bilayer here and let's draw this channel much bigger. So here it is, nice and blown up so that we can see it. And basically it is a hexamer of proteins. It's made up of um, six proteins all put together. So let's show all of these. So one there, two there, three there, four here, five there, and six there. Okay, so it's a hexamer. And the proteins which make up this hexamer are the aura I proteins. So one of these subunits which makes up the hexamer is an aura I protein. So this is an aura I protein. Now there are three uh, different aura I proteins known, and you can make aura I channels out of all three basically. So aura I uh, one through three basically protein. Okay. Uh, so that is what uh, these aura I channels are made up of. They're made up of these aura I um, one through three proteins. Uh, aura I one is very commonly used, but they're all they're all uh, important. Okay, and these proteins, these aura I proteins, just for a, a bit of interest, um, these aura I proteins were discovered uh, by someone looking at children with a very rare. Uh, um, genetic disease known as severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, uh, severe combined immunodeficiency. So by studying these uh, children with severe combined immunodeficiency, and it's always children suffering with it because they don't, they don't survive to adulthood, um, so you only see children with this disease. Um, and by studying children with this severe combined immunodeficiency, which is often abbreviated to SCID, uh, rather unfortunately, um, this um, disease um, basically it leads to severe immunodeficiency. And what they found was that in children with severe combined immunodeficiency, the um, T cells and B cells of these children uh, had very low levels of the aura I channel. Uh, well, they had uh, dysfunctional aura I channels completely. Um, they, well, they had normal levels of aura I channels, but the aura I channels were not functional, basically, in people with severe combined immunodeficiency. And when they actually looked at the genome of these people with severe combined immunodeficiency, they found that uh, there were mutations in this um, channel, uh, which meant that um, the uh, pore lining portion uh, was um, what they they have found point mutations in the um, in the chat in the aura I protein, which were uh, the portions that bind the pore basically. Okay, and if we just quickly look at the membrane spanning topology of a single aura I protein. So if I pull out a single aura I protein, then what you see is that the aura I protein has a membrane spanning topology like so. 
So it has four membrane-spanning domains, basically, and both the amino terminus and the carboxyl terminus are on the intracellular side. So this is the polypeptide here. It spans the domain once. Here's the amino terminus here. Then it spans the membrane again, spans again, and then finally it's fourth membrane-spanning alpha helix, if you like, and then the carboxyl terminus down here. And it is this first, this first membrane-spanning alpha helix here, which um, which lines the pore of the aura eye um, hexamer. Uh, so uh, what was found in these patients with severe combined immunodeficiency is they have point mutations um, that led to uh, changes in the amino acid um, amino acids that were on this pore forming portion of the aura eye protein and that led to this channel being defunctional and therefore these um, T cells and B cells with this defunctional channel in uh, had defunct uh, store operated calcium entry so they couldn't basically um, restore the calcium uh, stores uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum because this channel was not working okay and uh, that's believed potentially to uh, be the reason uh, that underlies their immunodeficiency so uh, that um, that um, that was how uh, these aura eye proteins were found in these pa from by looking at these patients with severe combined immunodeficiency. Uh, but uh, this is um, this is very important in physiological health as well as just disease. So basically, onwards with the story. So uh, this is the structure of this aura eye channel, which sits in the plasma membrane and is the channel that is going to be activated by these stim one aggregates. Now. Basically, when STIM1 aggregates, what happens is uh, the channel activating domain, this CA, um, the CAD d domain here, CAD, um, this is going to interact with these aura I proteins from beneath, just like I've drawn, these STIM1 aggregates are going to interact with the store operated channel or this aura I channel or this um, calcium release activated calcium channel. And uh, the specific part portion of the STIM1 protein that is going to interact with this uh, aura eye uh, protein is going to be this channel activating domain. So let me draw that. So one STIM1 protein is going to interact with each aura one pro aura eye uh, protein here. So let me draw this channel activating domain here. So there's the channel activating domain and then underneath that you have this acidic um, region and then you have the ER membrane straddling portion and then underneath here you have that EF hand uh, domain here and then what you have is this negatively charged bit so look back at this drawing um, I will colour in the bits so so far what I've drawn whoops, is this uh, channel activating domain here so this is the channel activating domain and it's interacting nicely with the aura eye protein so that's that bit from here, basically. Then I've also drawn this uh, acidic region down here, which was originally inhibiting the channel activating domain in the inactive STIM1 protein. Okay, and here down right at the bottom is the EF hand domain. So that's the EF hand domain there. Okay, so then that's not the complete STIM1. We've got these two other domains this negatively charged region and this polybasic tail here. So the negatively charged region is just going to sit here, and then the positively charged region is going to be up here, interacting with the uh, phospholipid uh, heads of the inner leaflet of the phospholipid bivalve. So here is that major, uh, well, that uh, polybasic tail here, and then that negatively charged region is here. Okay, so you have one STIM1 protein interacting with each of the aura I proteins that makes up the aura I channel, and it's specifically this channel activating domain or SCAD uh, that interacts with the intracellular aspect of the uh, aura I protein. And basically, when this happens, what's going to happen is the aura I protein, or the sorry, the aura I channel is going to now open. So it will change the conformation of the aura I protein, and it will move this uh, channel or pore forming membrane um, um, alpha he membrane spanning alpha helix. It will move that outwards, and it will open 
the channel. And then what can happen is calcium from the extracellular fluid can move through this aura eye channel into the cytoplasm. And of course, calcium is going to move that in that direction because firstly, the calcium concentration is, ma um, is much larger on the extracellular aspect than it is on the intracellular aspect. So it's around 1.5 millimolar in the extracellular fluid. Whereas the calcium concentration in the intracellular fluid over here is around 100 nanomolar. So the concentration gradient favours the movement of calcium inwards. Also remember the fact that the membrane potential is usually around negative 65 millivolts, which means that the intracellular compartments, the electrical potential, is lower than the extracellular compartments, the electrical potential, and it's lower by 65 millivolts, basically. So, calcium is a divalent cation, so it's going to prefer to be in the compartment with the lower electrical potential. So the electrical gradient is also uh, favouring the movement of calcium in. So you've got these two gradients, the concentration gradient and the electrical gradient, which are both favouring calcium movement in. So you're going to get calcium movement in when um, you open this channel. Okay, so that's bringing the calcium in from the extracellular compartment into the cytoplasm. So let's draw that on this diagram here. So you've got calcium coming in. And then what will happen is you will have the circa pump here, which will move two calcium ions into the ER. So that's two calciums there moving in uh, for free protons out. And of course, it will also um, have to hydrolyze ATP in that um, reaction there. So it will take in ATP and it will hydrolyze that to ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and an inorganic phosphate will also be made in that reaction. Okay, so what is going to happen? When calcium goes down in the ER, it changes the conformation of the STIM1 protein. The STIM1 protein now aggregates in the membrane and can interact with the aura I proteins that make up this aura I channel. Six aura I proteins make up an aura I channel, which is also called a store operated channel or a calcium release activated calcium channel. Uh, then what happens when that does that interaction does happen, uh, the uh, aura I channel is activated to open. It opens, calcium comes from the extracellular compartment into the intracellular compartment, so it's in the cytoplasm, but we want it to go into the ER, so it then goes uh, via the circa pump, the sarco slash endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, circa here, into um, the endoplasmic reticulum, and then you're going to raise your calcium level back up. Okay, uh, so the final thing I want to say before we just discuss a little few, a few little experiments associated with this is that if calcium level gets toxically high within the cytoplasm, so if calcium is very, very high within the cytoplasm, even if ER calcium is too low, this mechanism will not be allowed to happen. You do not want to open the store-operated channel if um, calcium in the cytoplasm is toxically high. Even if ER calcium is too low, you don't want to open it, basically, because it's just going to raise cytoplasmic calcium. So, there is a mechanism for stopping that, and it involves this negatively charged region, or uh, well, domain of the STIM1 protein here. So this was this negatively charged region. Basically, what's going to happen is when calcium becomes toxically high within the cytoplasm, calcium is going to bind to this negatively charged region and it is going to prevent uh, the STIM1 uh, channel activating domain from activating the aura I protein. So it will inhibit this activation and it will mean that this aura I channel closes basically, even if the STIM1 has aggregated and is trying to stimulate it. If calcium gets toxically high, it will bind to this negatively charged region and then you'll get this negative, um, in, well, this inhibition of this activation of the aura I channel and that's there to protect the cell from um, well from toxicity um, of calcium okay right so we'll uh, call it there for this video and in the next video we'll discuss some experiments that you can do associated with this uh, store operated calcium entry